by the time Annalise Schinzinger was seven years old, she had lived in Istanbul for five years and traveled around the world. By the age of 20, she had lived in England and Spain and had a passion for learning languages and experiencing diverse cultures. This led her to go to Brazil to study its culture and history, a time which profoundly influenced the rest of her life. Her professional careers have, been, have ranged from runway model to director of HR at a corporation, author, and death doula for 30 years. Her new book, Ayahuasca, Opening to the Mysteries, shares these exciting, often wondrous, and sometimes awful experiences from her life. In 1977, she drank ayahuasca for the first time with a Brazilian spiritual group, the UDV, the Unial do Vegetal. She was a member for 18 years and a primary translator. Her story of rituals, the strength of community, and the years of deepening awareness portrays a tradition of mystery with ancient roots and also a very modern drama involving stark and honest revelation. The story shows the role of ayahuasca in opening Annalise to dimensions beyond this realm. Those experiences prompted a significant change in the trajectory of her life, the healing of old wounds and deeper happiness in her everyday life. Annalise adventured with two researchers with researchers involved in ethnobotany and learned firsthand the personal, cultural, and scientific significance of ayahuasca in human development. Her work has contributed beautiful knowledge and personal experience to the conscious exploration of the sacred rainforest brew. Annalise has been writing for the last 30 years. She has written articles and presented her knowledge at conferences dedicated to studying ayahuasca. Her first book, The Art and Science of Caregiving, Stories of Inspiring Elders with an End-of-Life Guidebook, was published in 2019. With her retirement as a death doula in 2023, she was able to dedicate time to finishing her second book, Ayahuasca, Opening to the Mysteries, which is being released in summer of 2024. Annalise, welcome to the Brain Forest Cafe. Thank you, Dennis. Good to it's be so here. It's so good to see you, as always. It's great. Likewise. Thank Likewise. you for taking time to do this. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. And it's a well, real but... pleasure to me to be able to sit with you for an hour or so and reminisce on reminisce on our time together and what we've done together and your life uh, and and your life has been very much tied to ayahuasca in a non-traditional way uh which yeah. is uh and it's very it's a fascinating story you've lived a, a long and interesting life at least and i should perhaps clarify for our listeners that we first got to know each other Back in 1991, I think, when I came to Brazil for the first time and uh, to a conference that was hosted by the UDV, you'd been with them for several years. And at that conference, we cooked up a project to do a biomedical investigation of ayahuasca at the uh, behest and invitation of the UDV. So when we returned two years later, myself, Charlie Grobe, Jace Calloway were the part of the scientific team. You were tapped to be the liaison to the UDV and our translator and basically our just general resource and guide there. And we got to know you very well, and it was a beautiful relationship and a beautiful project. So thank you yeah. for that. We've kept in touch over the years, and here we are. Here so we are. <laughs> Do you have any reflections on that time or anything that you'd like to uh, 
share uh, in terms of going looking back that far? I know it's a, many decades ago now, but it's still fresh in my mind. The first time when I met you, you shared your experience right after the session, the UDB session, which was your first session with the UDB, I believe. You shared your experience with photosynthesis, and that was so profound. And I just loved hearing it and knew that your background as a scientist facilitated that understanding of what was happening in the expanded state. That was one of my most profound experiences, you're right. And that's the first time that I ever drank with the UDV. And uh, it was an incredible experience at the time. And, and what I look back on as one of the one of the top five of my ayahuasca experiences because, you know, as you say, my background is it was in a plant as a plant chemist and a plant physiologist, right? Not exactly a physiologist, but I understood the biochemistry of photosynthesis from a very abstract perspective. I knew how it worked, but to be immersed in it and actually experience it as, as a participant in this incredibly miraculous process was so moving to me. I mean, I, my role in the, in this virtual reality dream I entered was as a water molecule. <laughs> I was a, a conscious water molecule going through this process. And of course, the water molecule is, uh, you know, what is sacrificed in photosynthesis. You know, photosynthesis ionizes water to get the chemical energy to reduce carbon. We don't need to go into the details, but it was really interesting to me as I was going through this process to then, you know, know what was coming and then be totally annihilated, smashed to smithereens, you know, on the altar of photosynthesis, literally with lightning bolts. And But anyway, enough of that. This is That's not great. about my experiences. This is more about your experiences. <laughs> or yeah, should, well, that, that was my not, first thing. <laughs> so tell me, Annalise, what you 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 got into languages. You got to Brazil because you were interested in languages, and you're you were uh, inclined towards spirituality and self discovery. I think for many years, and and ayahuasca and your alliance with the UDV kind of opened that path to you, which was meaningful and continues to be meaningful, even though you're not with. The UDV anymore. Can you explain a little bit how you got into this and what that path has been for you? Mm -hmm. I was a student at the University of Sao Paulo, one of the largest and most respected universities in South America. And I had a, um, a fellow classmate in the geography class I was taking, and she invited me to spend some time with her and her husband and her daughter. Her stepson had just returned from six months with Krishnamurti in India. E excuse me, Krishnamurti is from India, but he had gone to Switzerland where Krishnamurti was spending time teaching. Mm -hmm. So he was dressed in, in Indian clothes, and he told me there was a tea that would be good for me. It was at lunch. Sunday afternoon, we were lounging by the pool at his father's estate. And I said, well, can you tell me more about this tea? And he pretended as if he didn't hear me. Later that evening, when it was just the two of us, he said, I'll take you next week to someone who can tell you about the tea. So we did. And the person who he, whose office he took me to was a real estate agent, had his own agency on a very busy street in Sao Paulo. And I asked him, can you tell me about the tea? I was so curious because Peter had told me that it would be good for me and I believed him. And I was at a place in my life when I needed to make a, an important decision about whether to return to the States or stay in Brazil. 
I'd met someone, I'd fallen in love, and I wanted to give the relationship a chance, but I also knew the importance of continuing with my studies. So Elio was his name, who was the leader of the UDV, Sao Paulo at the time. He didn't answer my question. He said, well, tell me about yourself first. What's happening in your life? And I told him, I gave him a brief summary. And then he switched the conversation over to Peter, who had just returned from Switzerland. And he, the rest of the conversation was about that. When we were leaving, Elio said, anytime you want to come back and speak to me, please feel free. The next week, I was at his door knocking. At the <laughs> eight, he invited me in. We spoke for 15 minutes. And he said, do you want to drink the tea? And I still didn't know anything about it. I didn't know it was psychoactive. I didn't go that far in my imagination. This was 77. I just knew it would be good for me. I trusted that. And he said, yes, now. And I checked inside, and the answer was a big yes. So he told his secretary he was leaving. He closed his briefcase. It was about 3 o'clock. We got in his car, and we headed out. Probably an hour, maybe even an hour and a half through traffic in Sao Paulo when we arrived at his house. He introduced me to his wife, which was great. I felt a lot more at ease meeting her. And then he led me up to his study in an adjacent building and gave me the tea for the first time. And when he poured it from a large pitcher in the refrigerator in his own office, private office space, two chairs, a bathroom, kitchen. So very it, untypical. Your your first experience with the UDV was not typical. It was, was a not one typical. on one. Of course, usually one on one. another large group in a temple that's how they do it right yeah it was a real privilege so that was it. a special gift to you it was yeah. it was my knowledge of portuguese i spoke spanish fluently and my portuguese was pretty good but he didn't speak a word of english but the feeling state you understand that with the tea with ayahuasca with it. Being able to understand things beyond the the cognitive mind, this receiving, the knowing. So I had a beautiful, beautiful experience. And um, I decided to stay in Brazil. I realized this is, I need to know more about this. I wanted to stay because of the man who I had met, who later became my husband. And yeah, ayahuasca was foundational to my life. So that was that was an inflection line uh, in your life, in your life's trajectory. You made the decision to stay in Brazil, and you made the decision to become more involved with the UDV and the T and its its lessons and uh, and personally as well. You you had personal relationships kind of related to that. I was a very dedicated member. It was beneficial in my life. I appreciated the people I was getting to know. I became friends, who some of whom are still friends to this day. Some who have left the UDV, some who are still in the UDV. But the, those strong bonds that are forged when we're drinking the medicine together, when we're drinking ayahuasca together, and having often having a hard time. And just knowing we're all in the same boat. We've all been through, we're there because we want to learn. We want to grow spiritually, personally. There's so much to learn in life. And it's like a springboard. The UDV with the structure <laughs> served as a springboard to reach a higher state of consciousness. And in the case of being 75 people, 100, 500 people, it's a field of consciousness. The 500 is very rare. That's just with conferences and things. But the, at the beginning, it was um, just a handful of people drinking the tea, sometimes in nature, and then increasingly grew. I was the 35th member of the UDV in Sao Paulo. Wow. So you got in on the ground floor, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, now, do you have any idea how many members there are uh, in Brazil of the UDB? 
the last count I heard was close to 25,000. But oh, yeah. there was a situation recently where some members left, definitely over 21 worldwide. Okay. And uh, uh, I think when I came, when we participated in the biomedical study, there were about 10,000, only 10,000. And wow. even then, I was I was impressed. But uh, you know, a, among the things we did in preparation for that study is we did a preparo, you know, uh, which you might explain what a preparo is. But but I was thinking, the UDV had to produce. They did this preparation of the tea on a semi-industrial scale, basically, and they had to produce enough tea to serve 10,000 people every two weeks. That's a lot of tea. And that's now, a, that's many, di many different nucleos, many different centers were preparing tea for their group. Right. And there were smaller groups called distributions that didn't meet the qualifications yet to be considered a, a nucleo. Tea was given to them also. Mm -hmm. So this is these are... Were sessions going on all over Brazil at the time it was 10,000 and currently. And at the time that you uh, joined the UDV, it was sort of in a gray area legally. There was consideration that it was maybe a menace to public health or whatever. And I remember one of the reasons they, the, the mestres wanted to do this biomedical study was in partly in response to that, you know, to demonstrate to the authorities that this was not only not a menace to public health, but a positive benefit to people's health. That was kind of the, the sub-agenda behind doing this scientific research. And, and they felt, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but I think there was a consensus among the, the mestres at the higher level that uh, having some outside investigators, Americans, Europeans, and so on, involved in this was a good move because it, it, gave, it gave the study a measure of independence or at least the appearance of independence. Would you say that's true? Yes, I, I agree with that. And and that that study scientifically was a lab bark in, in the study of ayahuasca, uh, because there'd never been anything like it. You know, uh, at least as far as I know, there'd been no, there'd been studies of the chemistry, there'd been a little bit of study of the, of the uh, indigenous use, but very minimal stuff. You know, it was known to a few anthropologists, a few botanists, and and so on. It was not a big thing. So the fact that we were able to carry out this study and then publish over the next decade about a peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers in respect to journals, that kind of raised its visibility, that greatly raised its visibility to the world, you know. And uh, so, uh, you yeah. know, it made a difference. It made a big difference. Yeah, it made a big difference to the groups in Brazil, the Santo Daime, the Unión do Vegetal, Barquinha, because they were being, they were under observation. Mm -hmm. For the first 10 years, it was okay. There was nothing, nothing happening. And then the authorities caught wind, and there was a session in Sao Paulo that I participated in I had returned to live in Brazil from 86 to 87, and four members of the Kongfeng attended. This was like the, um, the Narcotics Board, Brazilian Federal Narcotics Board, examining the sex. Just, kind of like the DEA in the state. Exactly. exactly. Like, yeah. You invite the DEA to your psychedelic <laughs> drug party. <laughs> right. Must have been very open minded <laughs> people. Well, yes, I must I agree with that. I spoke to um some of them afterwards. There were four. And I spoke to two of them afterwards and they had very positive experiences. They shared what they had experienced and how helpful it was. And that personal 
experience and also observing the orderliness, the respect, the integrity of members. It, it was such a positive impression of the UDV, and they visited the Santo Daimi and other groups, and they allowed the tea to be used in religious context. That yes. was their decision. So that was a landmark decision. Yeah, and then, um, so that that part was I in 86, 87. Right. And then you came along, and you're the one who had the idea and wrote the the protocol, right? Wrote this, the request for the study after the UDV approached you, because then it, it then the scrut the UDV Santo Daimia Barquinha being scrutinized, right? Because right. of um, concern about the effect on humans. Sure. Although and they wanted to put some data, some actual data on it, which which we successfully were able to do. And yes. That, that, yes. That and it's not uh it's not typical for the UDV to do this. I mean this was a special thing because uh, you know, later, I mean, they, in some ways, they're not friendly to science, you know, they, uh, maybe this has changed over time, but it was sort of like, well, this is a sacred medicine. It's not a drug. We don't want to be studied like it's just another drug. And they were clear about that. Mm -hmm. We were saying, well, yeah, uh, we understand that, but, uh, it is a it is a medicine that's got activity on the body and and we can study this that's that's not dis disrespectful i think our message was establishing you know curiosity and putting facts in place about what it actually did was not disrespectful to the medicine you know oh no i agree what what happened from that study in 93 then had a great influence in later on when uh, a branch of the UDV was opened in Santa Fe, and in I think in ninety six did they open the the Santa Fe chapter of the UDV? That sounds right. I'm, That's I'm... about right. And then in. 1999, I remember that date well, because that was the date that my brother was very ill. My brother was in the last year of his life at that time. So I was preoccupied with that, but there was a, a bust. The uh, the DEA, I believe, raided the temple and seized the medicine and said, you know, you're charged the UDV with a conspiracy to distribute a controlled substance, you know, which of course it wasn't, but, the, but, you know, that didn't stop them. And, and so, but Jeffrey Bronfman, who was the, had been elected the head of the UDV in the United States, happened to be a quite wealthy individual. And he used to be, he was the sky end of the Canadian Bronfman family. So he had a fat bank account, and he basically said, we're going to fight this. You know, we don't accept this. This is a religious freedom issue. And they did. They took it all the way to the Supreme Court. But then it was, and it was the first decision that the Supreme Court made after John Roberts took over as Chief Justice. The courts changed a lot since then, and not for the better. We don't need to get into that. But it was a unanimous decision by this very conservative court that clearly this is a religious sacrament. The UDV is a real religion. It's not some fly-by-night religion. It's a real religion. And they have the right to use this. And then eventually that became extended to the the Santo Daime and the other ayahuasca churches. And I guess the connection to the study was that we had the data. So that data became important in the review of the of the court in terms of whether to allow this. You know, and I 
did not testify to the court, but our colleagues did, particularly uh, Charlie Grobe, Dr. Charlie Grobe, who was the chief investigator on the study. And uh, I don't think Jace Calloway uh, testified, but there were some others. Exactly. And that to the, uh, the T being approved for religious use under the Religious Freedom Act, and uh, and that continues. Yes, yes, yeah. And, and, and the Central Daimi is now allowed to use it. It's been extended to the other groups as well. Is that right? Well, it started in Oregon. Um, oh. Danny Sheehan, who for the Central Daimi, that's another. A Central Daimi member can talk about that. Mm. Yes, it is. Right. Uh, it's not approved for therapeutic settings, but it is for religious for grounds of religious freedom. Right. 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 Which is, how do you feel about that? I participated in a, a gathering, a conference in Rio Branco, Acre, and oh my gosh 2016 was it no this was um before this was with the different religious leaders okay. leaders of the different ayahuasca groups in Rio Branco and there was a letter of of principles and one of the stipulations it was guidelines to follow to ensure that the the groups could continue using it in a religious spiritual context and one of the principles one of the guidelines was to not sell it and not use it in therapy so some people have not followed that but fortunately in brazil it is legal according to the constitution it achieved that status and it is legal in the united states but the, the as long as it's within the context of one of these recognized religions right and for the udv there's a very strict protocol that has to be followed they have to keep tabs on everything that is imported everything that is made the dnt content um, how many members were present. So the government expects a report that um, very detailed. It, it takes time and effort to provide that. Right. But but as long as they comply with that, it's it's legal and it's allowed. And and uh, I don't know about the Santa Daimi, but I don't think the UDV particularly seeks people to join i mean people hear about it i guess people are able to join the udv but they're not out looking for con convert no they're no, i really appreciate that about the udv yeah in fact for many years from the beginning actually there was more flexibility in the beginning with inviting people they didn't want people who would just come for you know, once or twice, the UDV wants people who become members and incorporate this in their life as a spiritual path, as right. a way of life. Yeah. Right, and they don't want the turistas, the the, the tourists. Right, and, and you have to respect that. You know, I mean, we've seen what's happened to ayahuasca in indigenous ayahuasca in. In places like Peru, it's become the basis of a whole tourist industry. And there it's a double-edged sword. I mean, my own experience has been primarily with those. I've helped organize ayahuasca retreats and so on. Good. I've seen people benefit greatly from coming to these retreats. Hey, good. But in recent years, I've begun to question whether that's really a good thing. Uh, they, they, I mean, it, 
it is a complex issue, but the question is, does that bring benefits to the community? Does that help preserve this knowledge and preserve the traditions? I know it definitely impacts the practices because you know it becomes it becomes a, a marketing issue. Effectively, tourists come to South America; they have certain expectations, and the market will respond to that. The UDV doesn't have to face any of that because they're a religion, and it's like. This is the way we do things. And if you can sign on with that and you're comfortable with that, then you can become a member if you're serious. But uh, it's not a casual thing. It's not a casual thing. And there's a responsibility to being a member because, as you spoke with Michael recently, who's working on the, the preservation of the plant, mm -hmm. conservation, because... Even in the 80s, when I was living in Brazil, the people who would fly to the Amazon to look for the plants would have to go deeper and deeper into the jungle to find them. Right. Every nucleo has a, a cultio. They have um, a place where they plant maridi and chacrona, the leaf and the vine. Banisteriopsis and Psychotria viridis. So they're being responsible to provide the plants themselves instead of going to the Amazon and, and harvesting there. So one of the, the responsibilities of being a member is to show up at sessions because it starts with how much tea can be prepared, right? And the structure where the set, the session is held, there's so many seats. So if someone is a member and doesn't show up, they're taking the place of somebody who could be benefiting from that experience. And so there was actually a, a request to not miss more than two sessions in a month and to, uh, to really take it seriously. Because the UDV doesn't actively promote itself very private i would say mm -hmm. and um, they know the the value of the opportunity so they want members to be regular and if they're not going to be participating to leave so that another person can come and take that space right and they're they're certainly on the right side of the issue when it comes to sustainability uh, they grow their own. They're not depleting the Amazon resource. And that speaks very well of them. You know, I have, uh, of course, my own experience with the UDV has been limited, but mm -hmm. has been, you know, I mean, when we were doing the study, I was uh, attended a number of sessions and got to know some of the people. But my experiences have been uniformly positive. You know, uh, their their uh, their ethics really is apparent when you get to know these people and know how they structure their society. I mean, it infuses their whole community, and uh, you know, uh, they these are really good people. <laughs> I agree. I'm trying to say. It. And they foster good values, you know, in their members generally, and uh, uh, and it, it it it's essential. It's it's necessary because it is such a powerful medicine. Yeah. And uh, like any spiritual, any powerful spiritual technology, it's prone to abuse. You know, it can be misused. And occasionally, I suppose, even within the UDV, there are people that don't really, you know, that don't use it right, or they get they get enamored of the power that it that it gives them, uh, and maybe they step out of the they step away from the from the guidelines. Do you think that's a problem in the UDV? It has become. It did become a problem. Yeah. More recently, with the 
um, both during the Bolsonaro presidency. And I, I hesitate to go into it in, in much depth, but some people took advantage of their position as mestres, as very respected mestres, mestres, leader, teacher, and um, tried to persuade UDV members to vote in a certain way, to act in a certain way. And Mestre Gabriel, the founder of the UDV, said from the beginning, this is not a political organization. This is spiritual. So to, to be able to draw that line and not bring politics, of course, politics are involved because of the legalization and all of that. But each person has their own worldview, their own experience of what is right and what is wrong. And the tea is, is good medicine. The tea is a true serum. That, that, in my experience, there's no hiding because we see, you know, the repercussions of our actions, of our words right away. It's a blessing. It's an incredible opportunity and gift. But some people don't either are close to that or allow greed and power to take over. And in their mind, they're doing the right thing. But it went against the guidelines of the founder to not um, bring politics into the, the sacred arena of this mysterious tea. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I want to share an experience I had years ago talking about mysterious tea. <laughs> Please As do. It is a um, psychoactive plant, right? Combination of plants. In the UDV, we call it sha tea. Mm -hmm. So um, I met three men. This is years ago. I, I think it was still in the late 70s, maybe early 80s. So one was addicted to heroin, one was addicted to cocaine, and one to marijuana. And each of them thought they were going to drink ayahuasca and have an experience, right? Yet high. Each of them, these were individual cases, so different settings, different times, all in UDV settings, sessions, but they didn't drink in the same session. So each of them drank five times and nothing happened. Nothing. Mm. The sixth time they persevered and the sixth time they had an experience. So that's a mystery that, you know, it's that Messi Gabriel called it the mysterious tea. So that was one of the mysteries I discovered. It certainly is. It, 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 it is indeed. It's very mysterious. I've had, I've had similar experiences. It, uh, it, the, it's a mysterious tea in, in, uh, in that it's pharmacology. It's doesn't have that much to do with it. You know, I mean, for instance, these people took it six times, nothing happened or five times. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. The pharmacology was there. I'm sure the tea was good, but their mindset was not good. Yeah. They were not ready for it. And then at a certain point, the tea, which I mean, that sounds animistic sort of to say this, but the tea understood. I, I attribute an intelligent, uh, sort of an innate intelligence to the tea. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at some point, it understood that now they're ready for the experience. I've known other people, you know, who have taken, uh, you know, in the retreats I've been, some people will take enormous doses, multiple cups, nothing happens. Other people will take a tiny, tiny amount, and they get a full experience, you know. And uh, you probably also heard of people who take it uh, during the session, nothing happens, they're disappointed, they go to bed, they <laughs> wake up in full buhashera the next morning, they're fully on. You yep. know? And so that is just part of the mystery of the tea, I guess. Yes. You know, 
it it will open itself to you in when the time is right. You know? Yeah. Do do you think of the tea as a teacher, as an in, intelligence, or or how? Very do you... much so. I call her. A, I consider her a a guide for me, a, a wise being, a counselor. I had some really challenging situations in Brazil in the 70s and early 80s, and ayahuasca was my, the word that's coming is savior, but I would go to a session and I'd receive guidance, and it helped me pull through those really difficult times. And I, each time, I, I, I grew in compassion and understanding and patience. So my interpersonal relationships improved a lot because compassion, just understanding that this is where someone is in their life right now. That's, that's what they're doing. Um, yeah, my book goes into more details about some of the situations where ayahuasca helped me. I'll, I'll share something in regards to the nothing happened. I went to Campinas for a session in the small temple on a hill. Temple is the word for the, the meeting place uh -huh. where sessions are held. It's a small temple, and it was windy and blustery. It was Father's Day in the States, and I had zero experience, and I looked at everybody around me, and they were obviously in a very high, expanded state of consciousness, very aware, and nothing for me, nothing, 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 four hours, and then I finally said, okay. That's it. I'm not going to. My lesson was one of patience this time. The session ended, and a friend came over to talk to me, and I stood up, and all of a sudden, I felt the bullshit. The spirit just oh, so strong. And I excused myself, and I went outside, and I thought about my father being Father's Day, and the wind was, you know, really robust. And I went to the bathroom because I had to pee. And a voice told me, just as sure as you're going to sit down to pee, you are pregnant. And I was like just a few inches from sitting down and I sat down. And I just knew I was pregnant. That's the way right. the teacher gave me the information. And sure enough, I was pregnant. I miscarried and the fetus went 10 weeks, 8 to 10 weeks, and the fetus went into the toilet. So that was an appropriate place to receive that message. It wasn't a planned pregnancy. So I feel that this magnificent teacher gives us information in a way that's tailor-made for us. One of my most beautiful experiences was after my grandfather died. I was very close to my grandfather, and before he died, I visited him in Japan. He was German, lived in Japan. And I asked him what he thought about death. And he said he was an existentialist. And he said, well, I believe that life is here and now. But I, I don't know. I'll, I'll find out when it's time. The old said, honest well, answer, right? Yes, he was very <laughs> humble. And I said, well, Opa, that's grandfather in German, will you give me a sign? Will you let me know if consciousness survives death? And he said, yes. So a few years later, he passed. He was 90. And I drank the tea on my own. I often drank in the States at a time that coincided with sessions in Brazil, 8 o'clock Saturday night, and I would drink at around 3 in California. And at a certain moment in the session, I asked for a, a sign from my grandfather. And I saw a huge ear. I mean, this is really very big ear. And the message was, listen, he was for all practical purposes blind. And he learned to develop his sense of hearing and his memory. He co-wrote a German-Japanese dictionary. He was fluent in Japanese also. And he authored textbooks, and he gave talks, and because he was blind, he couldn't read okay. his notes. So he had an 
incredible memory. You could recite a poem and he could recite it back to you. So that seeing that ear was so profound because the message was listen. And that's the redeeming lesson. I, I carry that with me. I don't drink ayahuasca very often these days. It's been a while. But I learned to cultivate intuition, sensitivity, which has helped me with my work as a death doula to really deeply listen, to observe and listen. It's, it's presence, but it goes, it's a, a, a depth of presence, right? So sometimes I'll see that ear to this day and say, okay, you've got to listen more. i listen more deeply, just pause. That's beautiful, Elise. I, uh, I think in a lot of ways that is the message of ayahuasca, is it teaches us to listen to mm -hmm. ourselves, to our inner selves, to nature, hopefully to other people as well. It fosters this receptivity, you know, if, if you're able to open up to the message that, you, that it transmits, and the messages that come into us all the time from many, many sources, but, you know, we're so good at suppressing them. We're so good at filtering things out. Sometimes the most important things get filtered out. And I, I think ayahuasca, like some of these other psychedelics, but I, I think that ayahuasca is very good at teaching us to listen. Yeah, and that, that's really important. Uh, but you didn't, you haven't stayed with the UDV. Eventually something led you to go off on your own. You still drink, but you don't, you're not participating with the UDV anymore. Yeah, I was a member from 1977 when I was 21 to age 39, so 18 years. I left in 1995 precisely because I didn't want to be a tourist. I didn't want to take someone else's place. I was still a member, but because of my work as a death doula being so um, demanding, you could say, I was working very intensively at that time, often, often overnight, you know, sometimes five and a half weeks in a stretch or three weeks at a stretch around the clock. And there were times when I was working, when there were sessions going on many, many, many times. And I left because my work with the dying became more important. And also, as an independent American woman, <laughs> it was difficult. <laughs> Not that I wanted to be a mastery. Believe me, I never wanted to be a, a, a mastery. And um, there is a hierarchy in the UDV. Right. And there was a point when I couldn't um, stand behind some of the teachings in regards to um, homosexuality, in regards to women, and it, not a, ch well, Messi Gabriel made his wife, Messi Pecanina, a Messi, so her name was Pecanina, and he gave her the star of a Messi, so he acknowledged her as achieving that rank of Messi. Oh, there, there are a list of things that you need to do to become a messy, prepare and know how to prepare the teas, sing shamadas, the invocations, tell stories, and the you know, height of the buhashera, be really clear and focused. And when I asked about this, I traveled around Brazil asking members what they thought about women not being messies, and each person told me their own view, and I realize there's a whole range of reasons why people are in the UDV and what their interpretation is of that. Uh -huh. Sometimes it, it might bother a person, but they decide to stay because of the value of what they're receiving in the community. So it was rubbing me the wrong way, like a grain of sand, the, the position of women in the UDV. And if you think about it, Mestre Gabriel had great reverence for ayahuasca. Um, Oasca is the name the UDV calls it, Oasca, who's a 
a counselor. There's a whole story about her. So great reverence for the feminine, for the divine feminine. Yet it wasn't translated beyond him. Can he made his wife a mastery, but there no, there haven't been any other female mastries. Interesting. So uh, that was something I wanted to ask you. For many people, speaking about ayahuasca as an apparently as an active intelligence, as a guide, it, it presents to many people as a feminine entity. It, uh, is it that way for you? For me, yes. But um, a, a, a gentle yet strong and fierce sometimes, but also the the power of nature itself, the connection to plants, to um, water, to the earth, to the sky, to the stars is so powerful that they are the teachers. They come through. Right. But when I have, when I receive guidance directly, it feels like it's, it's through the relationship that I have cultivated. And for years after I, in 95, I left um, the UDV as a member. And then 10 years later, I drank several times more. And then I've had experience with an American shaman and with the Kulina Indians and the Amazon. But the relationship I cultivated with ayahuasca over the 18 years of more regular membership, drinking more regularly, it's um, it's just a connection through the heart. And it's like higher wisdom that for me comes in the form of a, a woman. I did see a woman once in the the shores of the Amazon, it felt like there was definitely a yes. feminine presence. Whether that for me was the way she appeared so I could um, have a chance to, to, to a feminine incarnation of light as it appearing, appearing as a spirit being, right? But when I think of ayahuasca, I think of the power of nature, the mysteries of nature, the, 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 the sublimity right the the all the dimensions that we experience through ayahuasca looking at the background of plants behind you you know that's is so predominant predominant in my experience with ayahuasca is the connection to nature i've always been connected right. to nature since i was young but this enhanced it it made me appreciate so much more the spirit beings and that of course, the vibrancy and the, the fecundity of nature is very much related to the feminine. I mean, the feminine is the creative energy. There's the whole Gaia concept, you know, Mother Earth, which I I think is literally true, you know. I mean, you don't have to, it, it's not uh, necessarily a, a woo-woo concept. I mean, you've heard of the Gaia hypothesis. And I think there's something to that, you know, that is not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, it, it has scientific aspects, but it has spiritual aspects. And many people experience ayahuasca as a loving, feminine entity. That's been my own experience. And, and like you say, also mm -hmm. fierce, you know, it's not a young, beautiful woman that I experience, it's like you, it's like your grandmother to me, you know, your grandmother who has seen a lot, who's infinitely wise, who cares a great deal about you, but won't hesitate to hit you upside the head if that's what you need. Like, you know, that's exactly. true. You know, ayahuasca is that, you know, I don't uh, project so much the feminine on it anymore, but I've have powerful experiences of being sort of enveloped, embraced by this loving feminine energy, and yeah. it's 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 amazing, and it's heart it's heartwarming. It, it literally is ayahuasca. I think you know for you, I think you're kind of unique in that ayahuasca. You you came to it through the UDV. You've experienced indigenous ceremonies, but it's always been kind of a personal thing that is valid for you outside of any of these 
social or community context. It is like a personal teacher and yeah. an ally and uh, and still is or not so much anymore? Not, not so much. I feel that my ability to enter expanded states of consciousness through meditation, I'm more of a Taoist these days. I practice a lot of Qigong, being in nature. I am open to, if there's a time when I feel I need more guidance or want that depth of experience that I'm not accessing through the dream time, through intuition, through experiences in nature, then yes, I will definitely um, say yes to an opportunity that presents itself. I've been I received many invitations, but it hasn't been the right time. I just haven't felt a need to do that because the Wait. imprint of the 18 years was so deep, so strong. It, it did leave an imprint in me of a way to be in my life. And more importantly, I feel at this time, I'm 68 and focusing on living in the woods, living in the redwoods, gardening, being near the river, you stayed with us so you know what it's like here in, in Boulder Creek. And <laughs> grounding is really important to me, I think, because I was in expanded states for for a good part of my life. Now being grounded is very important. There's something, there's something to be said for that, and ayahuasca is good for that too, you know? So, I mean, you never really close the door on it. It's there. No. Of course not. It, it's there. But I think you've been in, involved with ayahuasca so long and in such an intense way that it's it's in your heart. You know, it's, oh, it's well in your heart. You don't have to take the tea necessarily to uh, to tap into it. It you know the wisdom yeah. is there as a living as a living thing. Uh, with, oh, yeah. I agree. And I'll share something that Jace Calloway told me as I was having dreams for five years, dreams where I was in the expanded state of consciousness. And he said, it's, you know, cellular memory. And then over time, the dreams, you know, diminished. But there was a time when I would reach for a glass of, of tea or I would be given it, right? And then before I knew it, I was in another state, in another situation, an elevated state, right? But I was sh being shown that my life was shifting from um, that regularity of drinking tea to practicing more Qigong and um, meditating more, dancing. I, you know, I often... Um, dance my prayers and I enter an expanded state, a trance state. Yeah. As an end of life caregiver, I've gone through the the passages of many people and I pray for them before they pass and after they pass. And I feel I communicate with them. So there's there's so many vehicles to enter that expanded state. And I I definitely haven't closed the door. It's been 10 years since I had a, a session, but um, when I feel called, I'll say yes. When it feels right, I'll say yes. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, Ayahuasca, in for years, some years, about 10 years now, you've been a death doula? Does uh, 30 years. Ayahuasca 30. Yeah. inform that experience or help you in that role? It helped me a lot because I realized that um, the spirit does, the consciousness survives death. That's one way of, of explaining it. The physical body can cease to it or be filled with the vital energy and, the, and consciousness continues. I've seen this over and over again in sessions with ayahuasca, and also um, communication with those, the spirits of those who have passed. So I have no doubt that consciousness continues beyond the physical body. 
So ayahuasca did help me with that. It like laid the ground, my belief in reincarnation and and um, just being able to communicate with my grandfather, with my father, with my mother, with the clients I've had. Um, but what really helped a lot was being with my grandmother. I was alone with her and the owner of the nursing home in memory care home in Laguna Beach said, You're, we had just taken the, her five days earlier. And she said, you have to come get your grandmother because she's going to die and I don't want her to die here. It was a new home owned by a foreigner, um, an Iranian woman. And she didn't want someone to die there within five days of going there. So I brought her home and I had some ayahuasca in the house and I anointed her. I totally did what my intuition instructed me to do. I anointed her and I told her how much I loved her. And then I went to the kitchen to get some cookbooks. I had a sudden urge to bake cookies because that's always what she did when she visited us or we visited her. And during those few minutes, I was in the kitchen bringing some cookbooks back to look, just continue sitting by her side. She passed minutes, minutes. And her, the look on her face was so peaceful and so serene. I realized death doesn't need to be scary. Doesn't need to, I don't need to be frightened of death. It can be easy and peaceful. And that took my fear of death away. That one experience. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And from then on, I could, I knew I could handle anything. I knew that by following my intuition, listening for the guidance, I, the next client I had, the first official client I had, um, was when I felt that I was a midwife to the dying. I was helping her cross over. I was there as a, like a coach, um, just following guidance on what to do and what to say. So being a channel, you know, getting out of my own way and just allowing and respecting the guidance that I'm being given. This is a this is kind of a classic shamanic role, isn't it? I mean, it is. Shaman goes into the other soul, other realm, and escorts the soul to the other side. And that effectively, that's what you're doing as a doula. That must be incredibly intense and, and very powerful work. Very gratifying. Very and pretty gratifying and scary sometimes. Oh, sometimes, you know, prayer has been my, um, I would say the, what I resort to, the, because some of the situations are very challenging beyond anything I had ever imagined. And prayer opens doors. It's amazing how things happen. Mm -hmm. Prayer. Yeah. I'll send you an, an, or I'll tell you one-on-one -on -one when we get together about it, an experience I had with a, a former Stanford anesthesiologist who just miraculous things happened when, when the veil was really thin during his transition, just miraculous. So I, I believe in the power of prayer. Well, I, I want to hear about it. This is, this has been great. Uh, I, uh, we're coming, we're a little bit over an hour, so we're trying oh, to... Thank you so hour. much. Is there anything we haven't said that you want to be sure we, we say? It's paramount that people who want to drink ayahuasca use discernment, um, that they take care with whom they drink, mm -hmm. and the providence of the tea, just asking some questions, checking around, because it is a profound experience, and it's important to be with a, an experienced guide who treats it as a, a sacred plant medicine. Yes. Sacred Someone tea. you can trust, someone that you know has your best interests at heart. 
in yeah. the same way that ayahuasca has our best interest yes. at heart. You know, uh, yeah. the, the person serving it has got to be uh, worthy of that, you know, and, and worthy of, I mean, ayahuasca is, bestows the gift, but the person facilitating it has to be a worthy, a worthy person. It's part of creating the right vessel for ayahuasca. I sometimes tell people mm -hmm. ayahuasca is a liquid. It will fill any vessel you create for it, <laughs> but you have to make sure it's the right kind of vessel in order to give it the respect it deserves. So, yes. so. well said, well said. Thank you, Annalise. This has been Thank a you, conversation. Really and, interesting. Uh, fantastic. Congratulations on your upcoming marriage. Uh, and, uh, Thank you. I Thank know you. Tom. Uh, I met, had the pleasure of meeting him last summer. You guys make a great couple, and I yeah. wish I wish you and him all the best. And. Uh, I'll see you one of these days soon, this year, yeah. later. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. We'll see both of you. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, this is Dennis McKenna, and I would like to introduce you to the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy and also our YouTube channel under the same name where we're presenting the Brain Forest Cafe podcasts. We hope that you will listen to some of those, watch them, and subscribe. If you like the uh, if you like the ideas we're presenting, the academy is interested in presenting stimulating educational content. Our vision is a world in which all sentient beings live together in symbiotic harmony, and we do try to achieve this through education, engagement with indigenous cultures, and ethnobiological explorations. So uh, we appreciate your donations and support. We urge you to subscribe to the Brain Forest Cafe and uh, share it, it and the content with your friends. And uh, we're very happy for your support. We couldn't do it without you. So thank you very much.